Hi everybody, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today's topic is how to discover what records exist. I get questions emailed to me every day, um, dozens of them, asking for um, help in finding this birth certificate or that death certificate finding a marriage certificate. And sometimes, for those of you who are new to genealogy, it's just a matter of the language that you're using. Um, sometimes it's a matter of knowing um, what records exist and what records don't exist. And so today I'm going to help you understand a little bit of the difference between um, certificates versus other records that will show what you're looking for, and then also how to discover what records exist. I do have a little bit of construction going on in the room right next to me, um, and so if you hear, hear some noise, hopefully it won't inflict too much um, with the sound. So first let's talk about certificates. Um, one of the things, especially when we first get started, that we're so excited about doing is filling in those blanks on our family tree. And so we want to know, you know, the exact birth date and the exact marriage date and the exact death date. And that's great. But you have to realize that um, the invention or the um, issuance of specific certificates of birth, marriage, and death are a fairly recent um, accommodation in the world. One of the questions I just got the other day was somebody was looking for um, a birth certificate from South Carolina in the mid-1850s. Well, the reality is, is that South Carolina didn't start keeping formal birth and death certificates. It wasn't a requirement by law um, to submit that information to the state until 1914. And, and the it would took several years before they even had 90% compliance with that law. And so the reality of finding an actual birth certificate prior to that is going to be pretty slim. And even there's going to be some challenges um, in the few years following that 1914 date. Um, the, so those are the kinds of things that you have to know, but not everybody's expected to know them. I'm, um, I do have a few genealogy specialties, but really I'm much more of a generalist, and so I don't carry all of that information around in my head, um, knowing exactly when and where records started being kept. Um, when I say where records started being kept, some, like South Carolina, um, when they passed that 1914 law, the records were um, issued by the, the county and then rolled up to the state level so that the state had a copy of those records. But in some states, um, especially those states that kept early records, the records weren't kept at a state level or even at a county level, they were kept at a town level. And so we'll look at a couple of examples of that, and hopefully that will give you the jump start that you need to discover what records exist for your particular research challenges. Now, with all of that said, um, just because a specific state didn't start keeping um, certificates or an actual formal record of births, marriages, and deaths until a date later than what you're interested in, that doesn't mean that there aren't other records available. And that's where that semantics, things come, that semantics thing comes into play. You ask for a birth certificate, what you're really looking for is the information that a birth certificate would contain. And there are other places that might have that information. Um, and so maybe sometimes if we started using the words birth records, marriage records, and death records rather than certificates, we might get a little bit further along um, in the help that we're seeking. And so I'll show you um, a couple of examples of the kinds of records that might still have that information, but that aren't considered formal birth, marriage, or death records. Okay, let's do this. So, um, of course, your, your challenge is to discover what records exist at all, anywhere, ever, <laughs> and then which of those records are available online. The greatest resource that we have available on Ancestry.com to do that um, is what we call the Ancestry Wiki. You're going to find that in the Learning Center, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, and then the option at the very bottom of the Learning Center menu is going to be the Ancestry Wiki. We'll talk about these two books here as well in just a minute. Um, the foundation for the Ancestry Wiki are the Source and the Red Book, which those, those particular books are very specific to U.S. research, um, though we do have some international content and, and information in our wiki. But these two books are the foundation. And then just like any wiki, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, um, think about like Wikipedia, right? Um, it's an online encyclopedia, but it is fully editable by the community, which means if you know something more, you can add to any one of these articles that were used to create this foundation for this wiki. So here is... Um, Actually, that's what it looks like. Let's start with where you find it. Here is just your Ancestry homepage. If you just hover over the, the Learning Center, 
you're going to see that the family history wiki is that very bottom option there. And when you click on that, it will take you to a page that looks like this. This um, wikis by nature aren't very pretty. <laughs> um, they're meant for information. They're meant for searching. Um, and so you, sometimes you have to read through information to see what it is that you're looking for. You do have the option of just kind of exploring around the wiki. And I would encourage you to do that. Um, if you haven't spent any time here yet, I would encourage you to, to get to know kind of how it's organized. Maybe just go looking for something that you're interested in, read the article, see what comes up. As I mentioned, the two books used to form the foundation of this were the source and the red book. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the source first just so that you get an idea. For those of you who used to have this book, we actually, um, Ancestry.com started as a publishing company back in the 1980s and this, the first edition of this book was published in 1984 and since then we've had um, two more editions. This, the third edition is what was used to create the foundation for the wiki. Um, it was um, it, it was edited by um, by Sandra Lubking and then Lou Zooks. If you're familiar with Lou Zooks, she's actually um, uh, an employee here at Ancestry.com. She's been with the company since the beginning. And so she, lots of institutional knowledge as well as lots of really great foundational genealogy knowledge um, went into the editing of this book. So you can scroll down here and you'll see that there is a table of contents for this book, much like any book, um, and that these are each one of these are clickable links. So for example, if you were interested in learning more about um, colonial English research, or I had a question yesterday on our tweet chat about Hispanic research, specifically families that immigrated from Spain into Mexico and then from Mexico into the United States. You can click on any one of these, and I'm opening these in separate windows um, so that I don't lose what we're doing here and have to wait for it to load. But I can click on any one of these and you'll see that each article was written by a, an expert in that field. So in this, ca in this case, it's George Rice Camp, who is um, a professor uh, at Brigham Young University who teaches um, family history courses and specializes in Hispanic research. And so he wrote this article. Um, you'll see here that it's a very long article. I, can, I, I don't want to make you seasick by scrolling through this too quickly, but you'll see this article. I mean, it goes on for pages and pages if you were to print it out. But we've provided a table of contents to the article even at the very top. And so if you're just interested in um, you know, vital records or you're just interested in military records as it pertains to Hispanic research, again, these headings are all clickable links and you can jump to that section of the article. There's also um, usually a, a sidebar over here on the right hand side that'll show you other articles um, that, that contain information related to this topic. So you'll notice this is an overview of Hispanic research, but if you are specifically interested in church records or you're specifically interested in Spanish colonial records, whatever, right? You get the idea, I hope. <laughs> so you can click on any one of these links and it will take you to an additional article um, that contains information about that topic. So um, one of the things that, that I have learned doing family history research is that it really helps to have a little bit of an idea, at least, of the history and the way that the, the boundaries were formed and the way that the governments were formed and what records were required when, right? Um, nobody started keeping a census or started requiring birth records because they thought someday some genealogist was going to want this information. These records were created for entirely different purposes. And sometimes understanding a little bit about those purposes can help us um, understand where to find them and what we're going to see once we do find them. So um, we were just looking at Hispanic research. As you can see, there are any number of other topics here. Um, somebody also asked me yesterday on our tweet chat about adoption. And uh, one of the first things you're going to want to know or do when you start looking into adoption is become familiar with um, the court records of the time and the specific place where you are um, researching to find original birth records for people who've been adopted. So all of these are really great resources available. And again, that is in the book called The Source, okay? The other book that is available on here is The Red Book. So the Red Book is divided a little bit differently. So the Red Book, rather than being topical, is geographical. So when I come in here to the Red Book, um, you'll see that it tells me what content's included, 
right? But none of the none of this um, content links are clickable because this content is arranged geographical. So when you scroll down to the table of contents, you'll see an introduction, which you probably want to read just to get familiar with it. And then of course, alphabetically by state, we see um, links to each state in the United States so that we can learn more about research in that state. So let's scroll down to South Carolina since that was the question that I received in email this last week. Um, again, it'll give you a, um, an overview of research in that place, and you can read through that article to just get a feel for how it, how it all started. This is also a really good, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for, gut check? <laughs> um, a really good just first check to see if the information that you're looking for is even possible, right? Um, if you have a family history that you've um, inherited or found online that claims that you had somebody born in South Carolina in 1542, um, chances are that's probably not accurate, <laughs> right? Um, because Carolina was really not officially, the Carolinas weren't really officially settled until the 16. Hundreds, right? So even though there are some claims to the area that date back to 1500, 1497, um, those are the kinds of things that you're looking for. Now, on the east, um, on the eastern side of the United States, obviously there's going to be a little bit more. Um, a lot more history, but as you move west across the United States, some of those time periods become really defined very specifically. And so it's just a way for you to see if the information that you've um, inherited is even possibly accurate. Okay, But again, just like on the source, you're going to have this sidebar over here. And this sidebar then is broken down by record type. So we're in South Carolina research, but now, for example, we're looking for South Carolina vital records. Now, for those of you who are new to genealogy, vital records is a term that we use that means simply um, the vital events in a person's life, specifically birth, marriage, and death. Those three events are considered um, the vital events in a person's life, and so records um, that pertain to those three events are oftentimes just rolled up into the singular term of vital records. And so that's what you're going to find when you click on here is information about South Carolina vital records. Now you'll notice that this article is not very long. Um, and I'm actually going to read it to you because I wanted to walk through one just so that I can use this as an example of the kinds of information that you're going to find. And I really want you to... to Connect the dots for yourself, right? Just because you don't have family in South Carolina doesn't mean that this isn't also pertinent to you because some of the same concepts are going to apply regardless of the state that you're looking at. So one of the very first things we learned in this article is that a law mandating registrations of all births and deaths in South Carolina was signed into law on the 1st of September 1914. So like I said, in many states, the mandatory registration of births and deaths is a fairly new thing. Um, in most cases, the early 1900s. And so when we start thinking, oh, I want to, you know, oh, I want a birth certificate. Well, that birth certificate probably doesn't exist before that. We'll look um, at another state here in a minute and show you an example of other records. Actual registration began in 1915, and then it says South Carolina achieved 90% compliance within a few years. Original copies of birth and death certificates are filed with the state, and copies can be obtained by writing to, and then it gives you a link, it, well, it gives you the name and then an address, but it also gives you a link to the website of the South Carolina Department of Health, their Office of Vital Records, where you can obtain that how you can pay for them, um, because most states require you to pay for access to those records. Um, and then it gives you some additional information here. So um, each county also has a copy of the state's records, and then a few cities have records predating the statewide um, registration requirement. So for example, Charleston, the city of Charleston, even though the state didn't require registration um, until that law was signed in 1914, the city of Charleston began keeping birth records in 1877, and they began keeping death records all the way back to 1821. So just because you read this first sentence up here, you can see sometimes it's important to dig down deep into this article to find out if maybe the place where your ancestors lived had different laws um, at a city level or at a county level than that supersede the laws that were put into place by the state at a later date. 
Um, here, here, Georgetown um, started vinyl registration in 1883. Um, and then, and this is a great example of some of the other kinds of records that are available. Just because the state um, or civil government didn't start requiring registrations of births before the early 1900s doesn't mean records of those births don't exist. Um, most of, a lot of South Carolina, um, the people there were part of the Church of England, and those parishes um, would have christening records. Now, christening records, according to this, were started, um, were created in 1706. And um, those christening records, they'll list the date of christening and oftentimes the parents, but very frequently they also list the date of birth. So even if that child, it doesn't matter if that child was christened when they were two weeks old or if that child was christened, christened when they were two years old, and sometimes you know, that, that time span is shorter or longer. Um, oftentimes it will include both the christening date and the birth date. It will then include the names of the parents and some other information. They also include mar marriages, and then they include burials, because burials were often done in church cemeteries. And so they, there's not going to be a civil death record, but there might be a burial record because it was connected to the church and because there were rights associated with religious rights associated with that. And then of course the death date would be listed along with the burial date in that particular record. So that's not going to be a traditional vital record, which is what we think of um, in terms of civil records, but it will be a church record. And so then of course we provide you with links to how to find out more about church records in South Carolina. Um, now, all of that was just about births and marriages, other than this little piece here, or births and deaths, rather, other than this little piece here about marriages and Church of England records. This third paragraph here, and again, we're just doing this, um, I'm being tedious about this because I want to make sure you pay attention to stuff. Oftentimes I get asked questions where the answers are, I think they're very clear, <laughs> and sometimes I think it's because we're just so used to having instant information that we're not paying attention to some of the details. So I'm going to be a little bit tedious about the details on this one article, so hopefully so that you can apply this to whatever article you're looking up for your own research. So the next paragraph here, it says, South Carolina had no law requiring marriage licenses or registration until 1911. So again, what we're looking at is an early 1900s time period before that civil record becomes available. Um, those licenses then it says they are not rolled up to or they originally weren't rolled up to the state level those are filed um, in a probate court at a county level right so that's how those records are kept and then prior to 1911 um, the marriages were attached to um, canonical law can I can never say that word correctly um, but but it had nothing to do with the civil law. And so the churches recorded those marriages um, because that's where most marriages took place. However, it says here the number of documented marriages is small. So then it gives you some other ideas of ways to find out information about marriages. For example, marriage settlement records. Um, if a woman's first husband passed away, um, there would be a marriage settlement so that the children of the first husband didn't lose their inheritance to the second husband. Um, uh, there would also there might also be premarital agreements in courts. Um, and, and so there's just different kinds of records, right, that you can look for. And then, of course, we give you links to where some of those other records are available, either on microfilm or where you can at obtain those records um, through newspapers, through state archives, other, other resources. Um, and then this final little sentence down here is about divorce records. Apparently in South Carolina, it was illegal to divorce until 1949. And then it talks about how those are going to be... Um, the access to those is going to be obtained through the county court. So I, again, I went through that article line by line for a purpose, and hopefully you caught on to that purpose, which is just to really pay attention to some of those details. Um, not everything is online. As much and as 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 much effort as we put into digitizing things. Um, and as much access as we try to make readily available online, some of this stuff still has to be obtained from the originals. And some of these have to do with laws. This particular article doesn't state this, but um, many states have a 100-year privacy law on births. And so what you're looking at is birth registrations didn't officially really start until 1915. Well, that means that none of those are public record 
until 2015. That doesn't mean you still can't obtain them if you're a direct descendant of that person. You just write in to the vital records office, let them know that you're trying to obtain the birth certificate for your great grandmother and and here's the information you do know about her and what you're looking for, obviously, is um, most likely her exact birth date and place and her parents' names. Um, you, you include that information and then, oh, I clicked on that. And then, um, then they will do a search in their system and see if they can find it. It's just that those records aren't publicly available to anybody until after that 100-year law has passed. Those laws differ in every state. And so um, I probably need to add, put that information here on this wiki page. I can do that by just clicking on this edit button here. I can edit this article. Um, and of course, then it tracks that I'm the one who edited, edited that. I can put information in here about the fact that, you know, this is the privacy laws for the state of South Carolina. You can't, records aren't going to be made online or publicly available until 100 years, or um, in some cases, it's 100 years for births and 75 years for marriages and 50 years for, um, for deaths. And so those are the privacy laws in many states. Some states, deaths are public information immediately. Marriages are public information immediately and births only have a, a 15 or 20 year privacy law on them. Um, in some states, I think um, California and Texas come immediately to mind, birth records are considered public records immediately. So it just depends on the state and that particular state's laws. Let's look at one more article really quickly. We won't go through it at the level of detail that we just did for um, South Carolina, but um, again, the point is just, all, you, you may notice I didn't go back to the original click on your state. I just over here in this search box, I just typed New York because I want to know what records exist that'll tell me about New York. And then I get search results here. I can, you know, Colonial New York, New York Family History Research, New York Vital Records, right? Um, that's probably the one that I'm interested in. You'll notice over here in the sidebar, New York Vital Records is in bold because it's the article that I'm on, but I can then click to go to the overview or to go to information about other kinds of records for the state of New York. So New York's a little bit different. New York's one of those states where vital records oftentimes were kept at a, at a town level. So rather than rolling those records up to the county, <coughs> excuse me, up to the county or up to the state, um, those records are kept at a town level. And they've even gone so far as in some of those towns to make substitutes, to create their own substitutes for vital records that didn't exist by using church records, cemetery records, census records, newspaper records. Um, and from that, they've created their own indexes or their own um, substitutes of vital records. And so then this article, of course, then goes into details about um, how and where that information was kept, which towns had different kinds of information, um, links to things like the New York archives and libraries, um, links to things like um, periodicals and newspapers. Scrolling down through this article, you'll see things like um, New York cemetery records, uh, where the, in particular, the Daughters of the American Revolution in the state of New York um, spent decades <laughs> compiling um, church, cemetery, church, and town records into published volumes, and sometimes that's all that remains. Some of those cemeteries that they cataloged, um, you know, decades and decades and decades ago um, have reached the point where the tombstones are no longer readable, where those cemetery records have been lost, and so in some cases these are the only records that still exist. And, and there's a little bit of that detail here in this particular article. So again, um, this, let me just run through this one more time so that we're all on the same page. This is the Ancestry.com wiki. The way that you find it is on Ancestry.com. Uh, when you're on the home page, if you just hover over the Learning Center, don't click, just hover, and then scroll all the way down to the bottom and click on Family History Wiki, and that will take you to this page, which then is going to take a little while to load. Now you know why I preload them, um, which will take you to this, this wiki homepage that then will um, give you the opportunity to browse through to different things or to, um, or to do a search on the specific state or record type that you're interested in. Now, the second part of the question, and this is going to be just, um, just a little bit um, a little quicker, right? Which is, these are, these are how you find out what records even exist, right? Does the record even exist that I'm looking for? What are some other records that might give me the same information? Then, of course, those of you who know me know that, that um, 
that the Ancestry Wiki is having some problems, apparently. Know that my favorite resource on Ancestry.com is the card catalog. The card catalog is found under the search button. It's the very bottom option there. And what this allows you to do is then filter to see what what information is on Ancestry.com. So we just went and looked at, um, at South Carolina, for example, and learned about when and where those records started being kept. I could come in here and filter down to South Carolina, specifically to South Carolina birth, marriage, and death records, more specifically to South Carolina um, marriage records. And what you'll see here are um, 164 different databases that contain records for South Carolina marriages. Now those marriages specifically you'll notice are not from the state necessarily, right? You'll notice here there's a Navy pension index. Those are um, oftentimes when a widow applied for pension, she had to provide a copy of their marriage record or um, some kind of an affidavit or a statement from someone, a witness that knew her and knew her husband and knew how long they had been married. And so, so try to think a little bit outside of the box. And this card catalog helps you to do that um, sometimes is to just think, you know, what other kinds of records might exist. Um, also, if I scroll down here just a little bit more, here's one, South Carolina Baptist deaths and marriages from 1866 to 1887. Um, it's not a very big database. There's only 4,000 records in it. But if your family was Baptist living in South Carolina during that time, those are some church records that are available online that might help provide that information. And then, um, of course, if we scroll down a little bit more, we're going to see another South Carolina Baptist Marriages and Deaths. This one covers the previous years. So this one is 1866 to 1887. This one's 1835 to 1865. So sometimes those get broken up based on how we receive them or who we receive them from. So pay attention to those. Um, this list in the card catalog always sorts by popularity. I think I've shared that with you before. Um, you can sort it by database title. Um, actually, sometimes I do both uh, just to see what what comes up. Sometimes I'll even sort it by record count to see the largest databases at the top. Just play with that a little bit. Get familiar with it to see how that works. But this card catalog is a great way to get an idea of what kinds of other records might give me a marriage date or might give me a birth or a death date when a birth, marriage, or death certificate or, or formal civil registration doesn't exist. So again, that's in the card catalog. Um, you can just, uh, let me reset my filters here so you can see that one more time. Just use these location filters and then use the record type filters just above that to narrow it down to a list of databases that might contain the records that you're interested in. That's all we have time for today. Um, if you have a topic that you would like discussed, feel free to email uh, us at ancestry or at ask at ancestry.com. Um, you know, be really specific about your research questions and challenges. We do read through those and then um, craft these presentations based on the questions that you're asking. You can then check our Ancestry.com Facebook page, click on the events tab there at the top to see topics, dates, and times for future live stream presentations. For those of you who are watching this live, I will be on chat in just three or four minutes um, after the presentation ends. If you have any specific questions about this topic, we can start with those and then move into some more general questions if you have them. If you're watching an archived version of this again that best way to get a hold of us is at ask at ancestry.com we're not able to answer all of those emails personally but we do use them to craft these presentations i hope this has been helpful until next time this is krista cowan have fun climbing your family tree